You can turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 14. So the first Sunday of each month, we're in John chapters 13 to 17, and the rest of the time we're in Acts. So right now we're in John chapter 14. Let's pray together and then we'll look into God's word. Gracious God, you alone are holy, you alone are worthy of our worship, and by worship we we think not only of just the songs we sing in praise to you, but we think of our thoughts, our actions, our words, in every way, God, that you've made us to be a reflection of your glory and to respond in loving worship to you. But we know that because of uh, Adam's sin and our sin nature, that we do not respond to you appropriately. In fact, we cannot do so on our own. And so we thank you for your intervention through the God-man, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life to prove that he was the Messiah, to die on the cross as the perfect Lamb of God, to pay for sin, to propitiate for your just wrath against sin, to offer us forgiveness and to grant us his righteousness. And thank you that he rose again from the dead to prove that he is Lord and that through his life we too may have spiritual life. Thank you that then you make us, by making us right with yourself, you also give us your spirit as a seal to confirm us as your children, and thank you that you promise to keep us and finish what you have started until our Lord returns. But we pray now that as we look at the specifics of your word in John chapter 14, as Jesus comforts his disciples, we pray that we too, as his followers will be comforted and encouraged by the promises that he has made and kept and the ones that he intends to keep. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So on the night of the Last Supper, Jesus prepared his disciples for his impending death and resurrection and and for his ascension to the Father, which is recorded in John chapters 13 to 17. And the Apostle John brings us into an intimate conversation that Jesus has with his uh, closest disciples and a prayer for his people in John 17. And in that section, he's bringing us into Jesus' care for them and teaching them how he will continue his mission, how they will continue his mission after his departure. And it's clear in the context that most of what's said to them applies to all future followers of Jesus, which, be, which would be us if we belong to him by God's grace through faith. So the first Sunday of last month, we looked at John 14, 1 through 11, and explained that what ties the chapter together is Christ comforting his followers. So in the first section, we saw that we are comforted about our eternal destiny and about our present lives when we know God through faith in Jesus. And as we continue in this chapter, Jesus gives them further comfort and courage to continue after his death and resurrection and ascension. So as always, we think not just of what this meant to them, but how it applies to us. So to those who know him by faith, there is comfort and encouragement for the Christian to continue because God prom- or, or Jesus promises God's own working and presence in his people by his spirit. Do you ever feel like you need comfort and courage to continue? Around here, we don't pretend that we don't suffer. We admit that it's a real part of our lives, not only because of the fall and a fallen world in which we live, and not only because of our own sin and and the sin of 
of others around us, we admit and we know that God himself allows suffering for our good and his glory. But it is the case that we need comfort and courage to continue as Jesus' uh, immediate disciples needed. And by comfort, we don't mean a state of physical ease and freedom from pain or constraint. That's not what we mean by comfort. Rather, by comfort, we mean the other sense of the word, which is the easing or the alleviation of a person's feelings of, of grief or distress, an internal peace and rest that alleviates our distress. Jesus offers us true comfort in knowing God through him. And by encouragement, we mean the action of, of giving someone support, confidence, or hope. And by encouragement, we mean persuasion to do or to continue something. Because Jesus lives and continues his work by the presence of God the Holy Spirit, there is ongoing comfort and courage in the Christian life. So we'll look at the three different sections of the verses that Aaron read for us this morning, asking ourselves, as we always do, what, is, what does Jesus mean in what he's saying? And then why is that comforting and reassuring? Why is it encouraging for the Christian? Let's look again at verses 12 to 14. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus reassures his followers in verses 12 to 14 that a life of faith in him will mean that his work continues through us. Those who commune with Christ through faith will, after his departure, be the means by which he continues working. He will also, he, Jesus says that you will also do the works that I do. In fact, he says greater works, greater deeds. Now, what he can't possibly mean is he can't be referring primarily to a greater quality or even a greater quantity of sign miracles. That's, that, that can't be what Jesus is referring to. Here's why we know that. We're studying in Acts right now in our other series, and all, although the apostles such as Peter and Paul performed sign miracles by the Spirit similar to some of the ones that Jesus performed, there were great healing miracles, even restoring Tabitha's life. The life of Dorcas is restored by the Spirit through Peter, and the life of Eutychus is restored through Paul. But the quantity and even the quality of Jesus' miracles was still unmatched. Turning water into wine. Raising Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus, come out. Casting out demons that the, the disciples were not able to. And Jesus feeding thousands of people with a handful of loaves and fish. So what makes more sense and fits the context of what Jesus is saying, he means that these greater works, these deeds, because of Christ going to the Father, it, the, the intent is that these greater works emphasize the greater spiritual impact that Christ's own completed work on the cross and his res resurrection will have by the work of the Spirit through his people. D.A. Carson explains it this way. The contrast in verse 12 is not finally between Jesus' works and his disciples' works, but between the works of Jesus that he himself performed during the days of his flesh and the works that he performs uh, through his disciples after his death and exaltation. At that point, redemption is won. The kingdom of God is triumphantly invading the nations with saving and transforming power. The locus of the covenant community stretches outward from its Jewish confines to embrace the world. And the disciples themselves are empowered and equipped to engage in far-reaching ministry. And this latter part turns on the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is 
the gift about to be introduced into the discussion. So too, what's the connection between the believer's prayer and God's provision? The connection is that he will do it. We must depend on him. That's the point of asking, of dependence. Prayer is a demonstration of faith, of confidence in God and not in self. It is active dependence on Christ and communion with him. You've heard me say before that we pray as, exactly as much as we need God's help. We pray exactly as much as we know we need God's help. So prayer is the act of fellowshipping with God and depending on him, seeking his help. And prayer in Jesus' name is not a magical incantation any more than faith is a means to get God to do what we want. The idea of praying in Jesus' name is, is to be in full accord with all that his name stands for. Recognition that he is the only means by which we approach God. Jesus said, I am the way. It, it is recognition that we depend wholly on him and that we pray according to his will for what he knows is best. The Apostle John will say in one of his letters in 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, toward God through Jesus Christ, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So we're talking about everything that praying in Jesus' name entails, that we can only come to God through him, that we wholly depend on him, and that we're praying according to what it is that God knows is best. The one who prays in faith, resting solely on Jesus, according to God's character and his will, can be assured of God's provision and God's blessing according to his own goodness and perfect will. So Jesus, Jesus is reassuring his followers that a life of faith in him will mean that his work continues through us. Ask yourself before we continue, has Jesus kept his promise? As we're studying through the, the book of Acts, we know for sure Acts was telling, or Luke was telling us in the gospel, look what Jesus Christ came to be and do. And then he made them a promise that by my spirit, you will be my witnesses. And then he continues to do that exact thing through his people. And he keeps proving that it extends beyond the disciple or the immediate apostles. It extends to all of his people. Does Jesus keep his promise? Is he doing greater works because of his atoning sacrifice and resurrection life? Yes, he is. Is it not then also a great encouragement to you to know that between Christ's first and second comings, God is accomplishing greater works of kingdom expansion through his people? That's what you've been invited into. Is it not great comfort to know that God answers prayers of faith in Jesus' name according to his own pure goodness, his own unlimited power, and his own perfect will. Are you not comforted that God answers prayers better than you know how to ask them? And now as we move forward in the text, how is it that Jesus will continue his work through us? How will he do this? By the Holy Spirit he has given us. This theme that begins at verse 15 runs all the way through verse 31 of chapter 14, the departure of Jesus and the coming of the Spirit. But we're going to have to break this morning today at verse 20. But how is it that Jesus will continue his work through us? Read with me verses 15 to 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus will continue his work by our obedient love through the power of his Spirit, who dwells in his people. 
Here's how I would summarize verses 15 to 17. While our love shows, uh, while our love for Jesus shows itself in obedience to his command, his provision for us comes through God's presence with us and in us by the Holy Spirit. What I find helpful sometimes is to stop for a second. We're, we're talking a lot about, because of the previous section, we're talking about belief or faith. And now here again, we're talking about love. And I find it helpful because we use these words so often to actually think about what they mean and to try to give ourselves a very simple definition. So let me give you just a simple working de definition of faith. Faith is an active trust an active confidence in the trustworthiness of God. Faith is an active confidence in the trustworthiness of God. And love is loyal affection for the highest good of another displayed in sacrificial service. Love is, uh, love is a loyal affection for the highest good of another displayed in sacrificial service. And Jesus demonstrated these things for us better than any other. So what we're saying is those who believe love. If we believe God, we love God. If we love God, we obey God. Obedience is evidence of love, obedience of tr or evidence of trust. Those who love Jesus by faith make a practice of obeying him. If we say we belong to him, we must be making progress in a lifestyle of obedience to the character and mission of Jesus. You know that you don't live a perfect life, even though you are in Christ and you have the indwelling spirit. But if we say we belong to him, we must be making progress in a lifestyle of obedience to the character and mission of Jesus. And so too, like we said in the last section, now what's the connection between loving Jesus and his provision for us? It is such people who have received the promised spirit. It's important here not to become confused about conditions or sequence. Hear what I'm saying. It's important to not be confused about conditions or sequence. It is the case that Jesus is saying that those who truly love him will obey him. That much is clear. But the coming of the Spirit is not conditioned upon that loving obedience. And it doesn't chronologically or sequentially follow that obedience. In fact, what Jesus is saying, even from the previous verses, is that the continued work he will do in and through his people is because he will send his Spirit to be with them and in them. The same is true of our loving obedience. And Scripture supports this uh, multiple places. Here are just a couple of examples from the Apostle John Moore and then uh, the Apostle Paul. 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. And Paul explains in Romans 5.5, 5, And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. We wouldn't be able to love like Christ loves without God's love being poured into us by his Spirit. So we are careful not to confuse the sequence, but to understand that what uh, Jesus is saying is that the works will continue because of Christ in us, and our loving obedience will occur because of the Spirit in us. So while our love for Jesus shows itself in obedience to his commands, his provision for us comes through God's presence with us and in us by the Holy Spirit. So in the text, to, to comfort and to encourage, Jesus calls the Spirit of God another helper, another of the same kind. And when he says, your, your translation may have helper, it may have advocate, it may have counselor, all of those are, are good words. The, you could just transliterate it and put paraclete. Paraclete is advocate, helper, intercessor. The noun refers to one who helps, who advocates or comforts someone on behalf of another. It's the, the act of coming alongside. It's 
It's the very word from which we get the word comfort, encourage. Uh, our word for being encouragers. The concept combines the legal and the relational of advocate and helper. So to, so to call the Holy Spirit helper is not to minimize his deity or the importance of this role. Think about it like this. I just grabbed a couple of references from the Old Testament about God. Psalm 121, verse 1, I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, verse 2, maker of heaven and earth. And Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So to, cause, to call God our help is not to diminish his role. And then also to call him the spirit of truth is to associate the Holy Spirit as the manifest presence of the very truth of God. And then to contrast that with the falsehood of the world, which is worldly precisely because it is ensnared by the falsehood of Satan. He is the spirit of of truth. The work of the Spirit is interwoven into all of chapters 14, 15, and 16. And here are just a couple of examples of the importance of the Spirit's work, both in the apostles and in us, speaking of him as the helper and the Spirit of truth. Chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. Jesus tells them again, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So also in chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, when the, truth of, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The spirit of truth, the text says, whom our text says in, verse, in chapter 14, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. What does the Bible tell us about the world's inability to see and understand things that are spiritual? Because they are remain unspiritual. And, and you were that way too until the Spirit of God gave you a heart of flesh that beats with spiritual uh, power, right? To have a heart of flesh that beats with and, and pushes spiritual blood through your veins. The world does not see him or know him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, this is not to say that the Spirit was never active on behalf of God's people before this. The Holy Spirit was active before this to work on behalf of God's people and sometimes to empower them mightily for tasks and for periods of time. But it is to say that in the new covenant, he will indwell those who have faith in Christ in a new and permanent way. And now we have to continue, but I ask you again, has Jesus kept his promise? Has Jesus kept his promise to give his spirit to those who, by his grace, respond to him in faith? How are you confident of your salvation? Why is it reassuring to have the divine paraclete with you and in you? Why is that so comforting and encouraging? He is your assurance. He is your knowledge that Christ will complete his work. He is the one doing in you what you cannot do yourself. He is the one who even intercedes on your behalf when you do not know what to pray. And now Jesus comforts and encourages his disciples that his resurrection from the dead will be confirmation for them that he will keep all of these promises as well. 
John 14, 18 to 20, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. The resurrection comforts and encourages us that Jesus has kept and will keep his promises. When you celebrate every single Sunday, not just last Sunday that is specifically Easter, Resurrection Sunday, but every Sunday you're celebrating the Lord's day because Christ arose. And that is your comfort and it gives you courage that Jesus will keep all of his promises. He will not leave you as orphans. When we hear of war and of death, when we think about all that has transpired in, in recent years in Ukraine, in recent days uh, near Israel and Gaza, when we experience for ourselves or those close to us the premature death of parents, we can, we can picture some of us perhaps even experienced the sadness and the plight of children left without the love and the care and the protection of their parents. We can see it. We can feel it. We can empathize. But Jesus is reassuring his disciples that his death will not mean that. In fact, his death and resurrection will be the very thing that ensures their permanent adoption as sons and daughters of God. It looks like the defeat, but it's the eucatastrophe. Christ wins. God wins. God is accomplishing through this suffering, through this death, everything that he promised. This is the guarantee that Jesus can forgive sins and grant you his righteousness. So the time frame of this coming to them again seems most immediately to refer to the resurrection. The world will not see me, but you will see me. Jesus appearing to his followers as proof of the resurrection, but, but not appearing to the world. And he says to them, because I live, you also will live. Because of my resurrection, you will have spiritual life, which is eternal. In that day, you will know. Again, most clearly points to the resurrection. But of course, the resurrection of Jesus has implications for the other timing, uh, the comings that he's been speaking of. When he comes in to, the, to be with them in his spirit, there are implications of that promise that he will, they will see him with the eyes of faith. They will experience the indwelling spirit. And there are implications for his continued work and keeping all of his promises, including his return to take us home to be with him. In eternity. In that day, Jesus says, when you see me again in the resurrection and when I appear to you, you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Because Jesus' resurrection inaugurates the dawning kingdom in which there is a, a new intimacy of relationship to God made available by faith in Jesus. So this is speaking of the security of that familial bond made certain and complete through Christ's death and resurrection, purchasing our adoption. It speaks of the security of the closeness and intimacy of that relationship. Has Jesus kept his promise? Has Jesus kept his promise? Have you experienced a relationship with God knowing that you are his child? because of what Christ has done? Are you not comforted and encouraged when you remember that Jesus kept his promise and rose from the grave? Because he lives, you also can live. So by faith, we, God's family, we have comfort for today and we have courage for tomorrow because Jesus has kept and will keep all of his promises. Jesus will continue his work in us and he will continue his work through us by the presence and power of God, the Holy Spirit. Christ has kept and will keep all his promises. 
Because God is God, there's no fickleness in keeping his promises. Because God is God, there's no fickleness in keeping his promises. Because God is God, there's no faltering. There's no frailty in keeping his promises. What God says, he will do. If we rely on Jesus by faith, we have confident assurance that he has given us his resurrection life. And we will love him by our obedience because he will be present in us by his spirit doing his work to grow us and to expand his kingdom. And as we have one another, a family of faith, to help us keep our hearts and minds focused on the comfort and the courage that is ours in Christ Jesus, let's do so more and more until, as we see the day approaching. Jesus is coming again, And we can comfort and encourage one another with these words, the very promises of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray, and then the praise team will return. And after that, we'll close by taking the Lord's table together. Our gracious God, we love you because you first loved us. By grace, you have granted us faith so that we would Trust only in Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. And we thank you that through that you have restored us to yourself and taken our sin and given us his righteousness. You have given us your Holy Spirit to indwell us, to seal us, to comfort us, to encourage us, to guide us. And we pray that we will desire to walk in obedient love knowing more and more the the comfort and the encouragement of your spirit at work in us. And may we as your people be diligent to live faithfully and to encourage one another with these words, your words from your scripture inspired by your spirit. We thank you and we praise you because of the death and resurrection of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.